and welcome. My name is uh, Nick Wong, and I'm the Science and Research Lead with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Uh, we're a, a collaborative-based organization committed to, to reducing the spread and impacts of non-native species within BC. I'm joining you today from Coquitlam, where I'm grateful to live, work, and play on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation. Uh, yeah, so thank you for joining us today on our, our on the fourth webinar and in the series. We've got over 240 registrants, uh, and uh, so yeah, it's, this is very exciting. So it's uh, co-hosted by the Integrated Integrated Vegetation Management Association of British Columbia and us, the ISCBC, and it's entitled Biological Biological Control: A Management Tool in BC. So. This webinar is approved for one continuing education credit uh, towards pesticide applicator certification. To qualify for this credit, you must participate in the entire webinar, including the quiz at the end. And we have the ability to know uh, how long you've stayed in this webinar. So this is really essential. So please do uh, make sure you, you listen and, and do the quiz or else uh, Gwen won't give you your, your credit. So uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and it, uh, it will be available. Uh, and anyone who wants the credit can watch after the fact. So um, there's some links uh, where you can probably access this at a later date uh, being put in the chat. If you do have any questions regarding the credits, please reach out to our following speaker coming up here, Gwen, Gwen Shrimpton from the IVMA. Uh, just a couple housekeeping things for Zoom. I'm sure you're all Zoom aficionados by now, but if you do experience any technical issues, uh, uh, please do use the chat box and Nadine will uh, hopefully be able to assist you. Also, everyone's been muted, so she, you should only be able to hear the presenters and myself. Um, and if you do have questions during uh, the presentation, please do type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Susan will be taking some time at the end of the presentation to answer some questions, uh, time permitting. So if you see your preferred question already in that box, there's a handy feature where you can upvote and bump that question up the list and you don't have to ask that as well. Um, uh, if there, if we don't get time to get to all the questions, we'll, we'll uh, send a couple along to Susan and she can hopefully answer some of those. And then finally, uh, there's options within Zoom to select speaker view or gallery view at the top of your screen. Uh, there'll just be a little, a little uh, slide here following up. But uh, yeah, we sort of recommend speaker view so you can get a good view of uh, Susan's presentation. So at this point, I'm pleased to give a, a warm welcome and introduction to Gwen Shrimpton, the Executive Director of the Integrated Vegetation Management Association. So over to you, Gwen. Please enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Nick. So as Nick mentioned, this webinar is co-hosted by the Integrated Vegetation Management Association of BC and the Invasive Species Council of BC. The IVMA is a recognized organization dedicated to the responsible practice of vegetation management throughout the province. Our membership represents diverse industries, including forestry, gas and electric utilities, railways and highways, and invasive plant management. The IVMA is the credit coordinator for the Ministry of Environment Continuing Education Program for the recertification of pesticide applicators for the forestry, industrial vegetation, including noxious weeds, and aerial categories. You must be a member of the IVMA for us to track your credits. Information on this program, as well as how to become a member of the IVMA, can be found on our website at IVMA.com. We plan to enhance the opportunities for obtaining credits by holding webinars. This webinar qualifies for one credit. You must provide us with your pesticide applicator certificate number when you registered for this webinar, stay for the entire presentation, and answer the quiz at the end to an, obtain your credit. So at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our webinar um, presenter, Susan Turner. Susan has been with the BC Invasive Plant Program for 29 years. She is a professional agrologist and a licensed teacher. She holds a BSc in biology and a B.Ed. in secondary sciences from the University of British Columbia. As the biocontrol specialist, 
Susan is a liaison with federal and global biological control scientists on behalf of BC's interests and maintains a current understanding of legal requirements to import biocontrol agents. She oversees the program that is committed to obtaining new biocontrol agents for the province. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Gwen. There. Good morning, everyone. My talk today, Biological Control, a Management Tool in BC. Biocontrol is the action of parasites, predators, and pathogens in maintaining another organism's density at a lower level than would occur in their absence. This is a basic graph of the intended biocontrol process whereby an invasive plant enters a country in the province over on the left. It may go unnoticed for a while, but BC has been increasing our network of eyes on the ground and ability to inform our EDRR program, which is early detection rapid response, uh, to catch new incursions. It is not, if it is not eradicated in this process from the province, the volume would climb to an unacceptable level in the province where its populations would ebb and flow according to climatic factors. This is as we move right on the timeline. This is typically when research for biological control agents would be initiated. If we have been able to find a biological control agent for the plant, it would then be released there at the top. Take time to establish and eventually decrease the invasive plant population to an acceptable level where native plants and plants of importance to us, such as crops, etc., could coexist um, and other complications caused by the invasive plant would be significantly decreased. Research is taking place earlier these days when possible, uh, such as flowering rush is a plant that's under uh, EDRR designation, but we are paying at the moment for research overseas because we do not have an acceptable or an, um, without highly intensive means of actually controlling that plant. So we've jumped in early, but not all plants, invasive plants in the province have agents. The legislation to obtain a biocontrol agent, um, agents may enter the country following submission of an import permit to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, which can provide approval under the Plant Protection Act. The import permit would include a summary of the research involved in determining if the organism can be used as a biocontrol agent. This is called screening research, which I will go into in more detail shortly. Just note here that adventive agents are those that have come into the province on their own, and there's no legislation that allows their use. At the bottom, we have um, mention of burdock, an insect on it that we have found adventive, metzneria, and there's no permit for this one to be in the province. Sometimes the natural plant, um, they enter, adventive agents enter the province on their own. Um, and we, we do not work with those. If we did, we might actually find ourselves in, in um, contravention of the Plant Protection Act and uh, it could harm the program as a whole. Uh, who is involved in research? Screening research can take eight to 10 years or more for an individual biocontrol agent to actually come into the province if we're successful with the research. Therefore, it is quite costly. Uh, for example, research into biocontrol for one plant project can cost well over a million dollars. Multiple funders are therefore needed for the projects, which form a consortium. Researchers from various institutions working with funds from multiple sources work cooperative, cooperatively to conduct the screening research. BC provides funding to both Ag Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and CABI. CABI is several global labs, approximately eight across the world. The ones we fund typically are in Switzerland and the United Kingdom. While some work is conducted elsewhere, depending on the needs of the plants, potential agents, scientific expertise, or even politics. Japanese knotweed is an example. They've been working closely with uh, researchers there for, um, in Japan for that plant. 
There are seven steps uh, to obtain biological control agents that we follow and they're listed here, identification of invasive plant interactions and impact on the native species and habitats, foreign exploration for natural enemies. Those are in the countries of origin where the plant has come from. The biology and host range studies, petition for an agent release, a field release and propagation, access establishment and field impact and long-term monitoring and redistribution. And I will cover these in detail. Uh, first, we identify the plant species. Uh, currently, this is often to the genetic level. We document the sightings, the habitats. We use IOP, which will soon be invasive BC, to record all that information. We investigate the impacts on economy, native species, and ecosystems to justify the funding. A case must be made to warrant funding for a screening project. So what are the current scientific political considerations taking place at the time? What drives are obtaining using the agents? We investigate the potential for biological control, some plants um, it's not conducive, and some of the insects that are on some of the plants are, um, they attack far too many, they're not host specific. Um, recommend priority invasive plants for screening projects to invest in on behalf of the province. And this decision, final decision is made by the Inter-Ministry Invasive Species Working Group. This is an example um, of one of our screening projects. BC has four species of knotweed. Himalayan knotweed is limited in the province. Giant knotweed has significant infestations on Vancouver Island. Japanese is quite widespread and Bohemian is also widespread in a hybrid of Japanese and giant knotweed. And as such, it has a sliding scale of features of both parents, which can be quite difficult to identify. We've had a climate model uh, created by Agriculture Canada, which showed Bohemian knotweed has the potential to become the most widespread in the province. The main focus of screening re research on this complex has been on Japanese and Bohemian knotweeds. Step two, uh, foreign exploration for natural enemies. The field surveys to find potential biocontrol candidates actually go out throughout different countries in the world, um, Turkey, Serbia, Japan, the UK, wherever the plant has come from. And some of the surveys have actually um, been inhibited, particularly historically uh, by war. Um, surveyors can't actually go into different countries. Um, in the country of origin, the target plant species, uh, the locations that they go to uh, match uh, the latitude and habitat um, as similar as possible to BC. The potential agents are usually scarce in their native regions because the plants often exist at low population levels. They're naturally under control. This is an example of um, genetic analysis. The genetic identification mentioned previously becomes more significant at this step. Additional genotype found in BC than showing here. So rush skeleton weed has um, several different genotypes and we have that little tiny orange one at the top there, a brand new genotype. We grow them different here in the province. Uh, organisms show, choose their host plant to the genetic level. Surveys for potential biocontrol agents are done in countries and areas housing plants of specific genetic types, hopefully matching what we have. Sometimes that's not possible when the plants have come here and genetically involved, evolved. Step three is the um, host range studies. Screening is the process of experimentally assessing the host range of the potential biocontrol agents to ensure they are specific to the target plant and will not inflict major damage to other Canadian plants of economic or environmental importance. A list of plants is created that includes the target invasive plant and native species and plants of importance such as horticulture and crop plants that are closely related to the target invasive plant. This is referred to as the test plant list 
and is vetted by top scientists in this field in both Canada and the US. The target invasive plant and test plant list plants are used in a variety of research tests. There are two main types. A no choice test involves a single plant provided to the potential biocontrol agent at different life stages. Will the potential agent feed on or lay on eggs on the plant? Can the potential agent create a new viable generation on the plant? Multiple choice tests involve offering many plants to the potential agent. This studies whether the potential agent will choose the plant given the choice of several. These tests are done inside restricted spaces as well as outside and the organisms sometimes act differently inside the lab versus outside in the garden. Again, genetic analysis. It is important during screening that all genetic types of the target plant are tested. For example, BC has two genetically different types of flowering rush. Living samples of both these types have been shipped to Switzerland to be used in the screening. One genetic type is limited to a single lake in the province, Bushi Lake near Quenelle. That's that little red dot up in the left corner. We are trying to eradicate this type but the screening um, is including those just in case it fails, but the focus of the agents is on the more widespread type and that occurs also throughout the United States. Flowering rush though is an excellent candidate for biological control because there are no other plant species in North America in this family. We currently have 12 screening projects that we are funding. This is the most we've ever had in the province. Um, at the bottom, we see the two brand new ones that we just started funding um, in 2020. So common reed, common tansy, the two tote flaxes, uh, Dalmatian and yellow, flowering rush, the hawkweed complex, there's several in there, Himalayan balsam, hoary cresses, a knotweed, oxide daisy, Russian olive, ferret's feather, tree of heaven. Descriptions of each of these projects are posted on our website here. Um, the circle on the top left shows you how to access it off the website and the bottom circle shows the title of the, the page. Uh, Target invasive plants and biocontrol agents undergoing screening. These descriptions are updated annually. Uh, the September 2021 document should be online soon. Once the screening research is complete, it is summarized into a petition that also includes the case for the need to control the invasive plant, the risks addressed and pro protocols for release and subsequent monitoring of the biocontrol agent. Drafts of the petition are also vetted through scientists in the US and vice versa for input and concerns. The petition is put through a rigorous process of scrutiny that is outlined in this federal document. So we are committing here um, in BC as a funder and a receiver of these to follow through on the processes that are described in the petition. Field release and propagation. If CFIA approves the petition, biocontrol agents are shipped to Canada. The quantities are small, such as a couple hundred. And they are very, very dear, considering the quantity of money that we have spent on them. Considering the costs, uh, each individual is quite valuable. They must first go through a generation in quarantine in a specialized um, Ag Canada lab in Lethbridge and then shipped to generally the top funding agency. Historically, we've propagated many agents and tents, but at this time, all are being released directly into the field. These early field releases are carefully chosen for security, uh, long-term safety, optimal habitat, as far as we've been provided the information, which sometimes consists of a forested step, and then we have to guess. Thereafter, we survey the sites often one or two only at the start um, to determine if the agent has survived and we call this establishment. An example is garlic mustard. Uh, we have contributed to garlic mustard screening project. 
The top funding province was Ontario, so they received the shipments in 2018. And we are currently waiting for these populations to build to a collectible level, so may, we may receive some in the province in the future. And then we have the assessment and establishment, assess establishment and field impact step. We study the timing of the life cycle in the current habitat, how to handle them and the increase in their populations. We put in transects to capture the initial plant presence and to measure the agent's effectiveness in controlling their host plant at the site over time. We collect data on how fast they can spread from their release location and initial dispersal locations. We determine how and when it is possible to collect and release them. We redistribute them in secure strategic locations in the province in order to study their reaction to different habitats and to increase the number of sites to mitigate potential losses. The BC work described in the last three slides occurs for biocontrol agents that are designated as a primary status. There are three status types in the province, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The first two status types, as you can see, primary and secondary, pertain to agents that are new or limited in the province. These agents are managed by Flynn Row, uh, currently Range Branch. Requests for secondary agents are required prior to Flynn Row budget planning, which occurs in March. Uh, the third tertiary agent is undergoing a recent change whereby these agents are designated as open to our clients to use as management tools if they so choose. These agents are safely established in the province, understood and potentially available. Just to uh, describe on the right hand side, there's a column that talks about collectability. This column shows up in a web page that we have. And these are the designations that are available there. So primary agents are not considered available for general distribution. We're still studying them. Secondary agents can be limited or mass and tertiary agents can be limited sometimes, mass or passive distribution. And the limited mass is actually intended to reflect the biology of the agent because some don't actually grow to massive numbers. The remainder of my presentation will focus mainly on details of how a person would obtain information in order to work directly with tertiary biocontrol agents. So um, Range Branch is creating a brand new policy. Uh, the opportunity to use tertiary biocontrol agents directly will be outlined um, in this policy. The policy will describe a clear definition of expectations, roles and responsibilities, a strategic outcome-based approach to achieving the goals, alignment with goals and objectives in our strategic plan. The policy will be in compliance with applicable legislation, so the Weed Control Act and with the Federal Plant Protection Act. And the policy will address only the federally permitted biocontrol agents, not native agents nor inventive agents. So first uh, step would be to determine if biocontrol is right for the treatment option in your area. And if uh, to determine whether there is a biocontrol agent for the target plant and whether it would be available for use, secondary or tertiary. Next would be to determine what is the right treatment option for your area of interest. What are the expectations of invasive plant control from multiple perspectives? For example, some people will have a zero tolerance for a plant such as on the edge of a hay field, while others will accept the plant's existence at a much decreased density so other values can coexist. Others will need to control the invasive plant for logistical reasons such as maintaining good visual span along a road edge. Uh, as we see, it is not happening here as spotted napoli encroaches. Uh, bio control will require long-term stable plant populations to establish, increase the number of agents, and have effect on their target invasive plants. So if your um, vocation is going to be manipulated, that is not the best place to put a release. This is uh, true for all agents, but the timing of these potential conflicts is important. 
Cyphocleonus, uh, four spotted knapweed, could survive in areas that are mowed up to the beginning of July and then again in September, October, as the agents will be safely tucked away in the roots as larva. By contrast, the knapweed seed feeding fly Europhora finis would need spring plants to grow to maturity in order to lay eggs on the buds and consume the season's main seed, main seed production. However, mowing from July onward would kill the agents on those plants, but prevent the plant from creating its typical secondary flush of buds and seeds. As this fly is very common and mobile, it would likely fill back in from a neighboring patch. So this is an excerpt out of a document that we will be providing. If biocontrol is the main option chosen, one must determine which agent to use. The status of individual biocontrol agents will be supplied in an annual document on our website. Note that all tertiary agents will have geographic subcategories pertaining to the range branch and basic plant program management zones. That is on the right-hand side. When a zone is still designated as secondary, range branch will continue to work on that insect in that zone. The provincial government will also continue to work on tertiary agents in any zone for the purposes of determining effectiveness of the agent and the level of control of its host plant within the province. We will follow this Cyphocleonis example circled there, listed uh, here on diffuse knapweed, but we will follow it through on spotted knapweed. A person will need to verify that the agent is tertiary on the plant species they want to control. Cyphocleonis is tertiary on both diffuse and spotted knapweeds and has the same subzone designations, um, but not so for agents such as um, a moth called Caliphasia lanella, which is tertiary on Dalmatian toe flaps, but secondary on yellow. This table contains all the agents that exist in the province, even those that are not permitted. It can be searched by the target invasive plant or the agent name. The links connect to short descriptions of the plant and uh, or thorough descriptions of the agents. And the red circles on the far left show you the page or the, uh, the title to click to get to this particular matrix table. And then we have each of the names. And on the far right hand side, we have the collect uh, collectability column graph was already mentioned. Shown here is a page resulting from clicking uh, the agent. And this displays uh, information on the knapweed root feeding Cyphocolonus cicades. It contains all the recorded details we have that pertain specifically to that individual plant. These pages are updated over time when new information is compiled. This is only an excerpt. This is probably two to three pages long describing everything that we know about this agent. Uh, it is also imperative to discover when to work with an agent as soon as possible in your planning prior to the field season. When some agents' life uh, cycles will, will have them present in April or May and will be gone until the following year. So you would miss your opportunity if you waited too long. Also, it is necessary to understand which life cycle they, uh, you will need to work with. This varies on the different activities you would undertake with the agent. For example, collecting and releasing Cyphocleonis is done while they are adults in late June and August, but monitoring can easily be done in the last week of May to mid-July when they are larvae or pupae in the roots. It is best to look for the larvae when trying to find collection sites as this is done a month ahead of time. Um, for needing to organize and perform the collections. Monitoring can be performed for this agent throughout its multiple life stages. However, some biocontrol species, such as the seed feeding weevil Lorinus minutus, the F1 generation, the one born to adults in that year, just mills about eating before it prepares to overwinter in the duff. They do not congregate together to breed so they can be more difficult to locate. So you need to know which stage um, of agent is the best to work with. Um, we have sorted all the secondary and tertiary agents in a seasonal calendar 
that includes the various activities to make planning easier. The one online is dated as 2015, just mentioned here below, but we have an update in draft that should be coming out before the next field season. Arrange to obtain biocontrol agents. Again, we must confirm the status. Secondary agents you would obtain from uh, Flunro staff, the invasive plant program. And tertiary agents would be either from partner agencies or um, you would be collecting in the field. First, you would want to determine though, does the secondary or tertiary agent already exist on the site before requesting um, agents from anybody? You could look in IOP or Invasive BC as it comes out, uh, survey the plants on the site. And tertiary agents are quite widespread in the province, so there's a good chance that it's going to be available on your site of interest. But if it's not there, then um, you would need to go through the steps to determine its availability. So you'd have to arrange to do the uh, collections or find sites and or discuss with the NGOs neighboring um, either within your area or with neighboring committees. If you need to find a collection site yourself, uh, you would compile a list of, of sites from Invasives BC, uh, currently IAP, um, or using your local knowledge. If possible, you would add sites that were collectible in the past, if you knew them, or uh, we will have a designation in Invasives BC. Uh, collection sites, though, do not last. Eventually, the plants would decrease so much that the biocontrol agent population cannot build. This is the ideal. Um, you would choose the list of sites with recorded densities of plentiful agents, six to 10 plants if possible. Um, you would choose uh, sites that have decent area distribution codes. There's, there's uh, plenty to be had. You'd also look for sites that have the habitat conditions as close to ideal as the agent as possible. That would, information would come off the web page mentioned. And then the, um, in the field, you would monitor multiple sites and collect data consistently for all sites, such as looking at uh, for 30 minutes at each site, digging up 25 to 30 plants at each site and cutting open the roots for Cyphocleonis. Then you would choose the sites with the highest numbers of larvae per root and lots of plants observed on the site. Sometimes the sites have lots of agents because there's very few remaining plants and they congregate, but it might not be worth your time to go back to try and collect there. And depending on the quanti quantity of agents sought, you might have to go to several sites and then um, bundle them all together. For agents with secondary status, status, either as a provincial designation or as a zone designation of a provincial tertiary agent, Province will also have and be searching for new collection sites that will be marked for use for the government only to provide for provincial needs. And you choosing the release site ahead of collections and releasing agents or trying to release agents is um, highly recommended. This will give the agents the best chance. Um, you won't be driving around with them in your truck for a couple of days trying to find a site. You can transfer directly and they will have um, be the healthiest and the best chance to survive. So for choosing a site, again, we want to know how the plant grows. What is its density and distribution code? Do you want the, um, the best opportunity? What, how big is the infestation, the area of it? It's very large here on the left-hand side. Uh, what is the level of infestation in the general geographic area? Uh, bowel control agents are like wildlife and they actually need plant corridors to move to once they run out of food. But if it's too big, like we have on the left-hand side, it's really, really hard to find them again. So sometimes putting them at the edge or on a smaller patch um, would be very useful. And then what is the habitat of the site? Uh, the soil type, shade or sunny? Is there water nearby? Some agents like to uh, need to have water. Um, these 
Again, this information is coming off the web. And what are the invasive plant treatments occurring by a variety of agents, agencies in the public, and would they conflict with your treatment of a biocontrol agent? Uh, some ex activities are acceptable to agents and others are not. As, as mentioned previously, timing of some of these agents uh, activities is very important to the survival and effectiveness of the agents. Cyclocolonis is an example that, uh, of an agent that can be used for integrative pest management. And since cyphos are inside the root, they can withstand spring flooding and they are then useful as well uh, to be in riparian zones on sites that you're spraying the rest of the area with herbicide, but you cannot get close to the river's edge here. Then you go out and collect your biocontrol agents. And you have to understand the biology and their habits in order to do so. For example, Cyphocleonis weevils emerge from the roots, then sun themselves to harden their cuticle. That's their, their back. So they can often to uh, be found high on the plants, even on neighboring plants, like on the grass shown here. So they're sunning themselves. Male Cyphocleonis emerge first, about a week ahead of the females. And they, uh, so you don't start collecting when you very first see them or you'll get all boys. They will start to breed and then the females will oviposit insects. Collection must occur before the females run out of eggs. So there's an optimal window. Cyphocleonis, like many weevil species, will often feign death and drop to the site. So you have to approach the plants very carefully and very stealthy. It is best to hand pick these weevils and not sweep for them as they are very large and you can hurt them. The approach to and the handling techniques, collecting, releasing agents have been summarized uh, into this document mentioned here and other online documents. It includes an array of information such as how many agents to keep in containers, how to store them, not to keep them in the sun, um, putting stems inside the containers so the agents can actually get away from each other because siphos, for example, will fight and bite each other if they're all crowded. Um, and also how to sex them. Siphos are actually have the potential to determine whether they're male or female. It's the only one we actually sex. Um, and then you can tell when the females actually start on the site. And then you want to record all the data and enter it into the provincial system. Make sure to include which sites you collect, the quantities you collect from. This is very important because the province, we're now working with Ag Canada to investigate genetics and potentially the change over time of agents from various sources. And then you go to release your biocontrol agents. You collect site data before letting the biocontrol agents go so that you don't accidentally step on them. Uh, this site data is basic, does not include transects or other methods, including detailed plant community data. These agents are tertiary and have been around for quite a while and it would be difficult to measure a plant community change without data from early years. You liberate the agents in a single location, don't spread them over the site. Typically you're releasing them at the time that they're breeding and you would save them the energy and the chance of uh, coming back together, finding one another. Do not release on anthills. We've seen a single healthy plant remaining on sites that are located in the middle of an anthill, safe from predation of their bob control agents that have been eaten by the ants. And again, record all data. Monitoring biocontrol agents. Monitoring is an essential activity in using biocontrol for invasive plant management. Monitor releases that you have made. If you've made, re made releases of secondary agents, the province may choose to monitor these. Monitoring methods vary according to the biology of the agent and are described. There are recommended spans of time to monitor the agent. It's necessary to know if the agents have survived and for more than one year, this is called establishment. Knowing how fast the agent will spread from the release location will assist in future biocontrol release decisions, such as how close do I need to make my um, releases? Um, how fast will they move across the landscape to different areas? 
Knowing where the agent locally disperses to then, um, the landscape will inform future decisions as well. Monitoring will consist of methods that are in the handling technique document mentioned and then entered into Invasive BC uh, to provide additional data to the province. So it's very useful for everybody. Uh, so we can make informed decisions of whether the agent is effective at controlling the target plant and in what habitats or whether additional agents are needed. This may be a different species we already have, or do we have to go back to the drawing board and start funding uh, for another agent? Spotted knapweed agents, as an example, though, they have basically looked at all areas across the globe that would have spotted knapweed, and there has not been determined um, any further agents that we could get for this plant. Uh, monitoring will also provide uh, for data for future potential collection sites. And again, record, record, record. So, data informs all biocontrol actions. In the current Provincial Invasive Avian Plant Program application, or IAP, uh, soon to be uh, retired and replaced with the BC's new Invasive Species Database and Mobile Application. It includes observation, treatment, efficacy, and long-term monitoring records. It covers both invasive plants and invasive animals. So Ministry of Environment will be um, adding their information into here for uh, pigs, um, fish, all different types of species. There's a mobile app for data collection and a web-based platform for data viewing and analysis. And the mobile app has both an online and an offline functionality. You can choose an activity, zoom to your location, draw or track a polygon, a line or point for the activity, complete the form and submit directly to the database. Uh, Reporter Weed, which some of you may have been using, has been replaced by the Invasive BC mobile app. So Reporter Weed is no longer functional. Report Invasive BC is now the reporting app that should be used. Invasive BC will be discussed in more detail by Crystal Chadburn at the upcoming IVMA forum. At the bottom here is um, a link to a demo that you can pull up and watch. 13 minutes. And then does it work? Data analysis. If you have collected your data, you might um, use this invasive species uh, historical records to um, determine whether uh, it has established or is starting to work on your site. The compilation of data will also assist the province on whether biocontrol for a particular plant is, is successful on a provincial scale. Uh, again, whether we meet, need more agents, we will be able to uh, produce uh, summaries that will have trends, hopefully, uh, investigate topics such as its habitat limitations, um, its effectiveness for control on a target, and data will also assist the province to work with partner agencies such as Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada on specific uh, agent plant complexes, such as the current efforts to determine if biocontrol is having success on spotted knapweed and St. John's wort. And if you've seen any of the Ag Canada uh, presentations that have been occurring this fall, uh, the spotted knapweed project has been well underway. They're using our old transect uh, information locations from across the province. And um, they're finding that spotted knapweed is decreasing in the province. St. John's wort um, project is just being initiated this year. So the data analysis will help us understand where individual plant and agent combination uh, complexes fall out on this graph. So after we've released the agent, some of them like hound's tongue will be off on this far right side that will ebbs and flows during uh, due to climatic conditions, habitat conditions, but spotted knapweed, we're not quite sure where we fall on this particular graph. And we are hoping that we're uh, coming through to the very end. 
but we will see after after the project's done. These um, are the different complexes or the plant species that we consider six biological success. So under control in the province is plumeless thistle, nodding thistle, bull thistle, and houndstongue. Of lower concern, we have purple loosestrife. It has localized control. Tansy ragwort, the south coast populations are under control. Dalmatian toad flax, the southern populations in the province. St. John's wort has localized control. And diffused knapweed. Uh, localized, typically we don't uh, collect and distribute agents for this plant. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Susan, for that uh, excellent and very detailed presentation. I have like hearing, oh, I'm gonna turn my camera on there, sorry. Hearing uh, eight to 10 years feels so long, but uh, totally, totally understandable. Um, so we've got time for questions until about uh, close to 10. Um, as I mentioned, if there's not time for all of them, we'll, we'll hopefully get Susan to answer a couple. Uh, again, if uh, you see your question already being asked, uh, click the thumbs up button to upvote it. And also um, the, the quiz should, uh, will be, is open and you'll have the chance to complete it to get that CEC credit. So don't leave now. Um, and just like to note, uh, as serious, I, as, serious as, as I was in the introduction, you don't need to pass the quiz to, to get the credit. Uh, the intent is for IVMA to ensure that uh, you've stayed for the presentation and, and paid attention there. So, um, Nadine should be posting the quiz link in the chat and we'll keep that, uh, we'll keep a final slide in that link in the chat up for 10 minutes after the webinar is wrapped up. Um, and just to note, please uh, make sure your questions are going into the Q&A, not the chat box there. Um, so um, yeah, I'll start with the first question here. Uh, it's for you, Susan, uh, Leah, it's from Leah. Um, are all control agents collected? Does the province have a rearing program? Not anymore. We used to rear um, in Kamloops. We had a propagation facility out on Egg Canada's land by the airport, if you're familiar with, with Kamloops. But the plant species that we have continued to work with do not grow typically in, in Kamloops habitat. So we're very dry here, but dry and hot. We had um, napweed was our main plant here. But as we move into ones like uh, flower and rush or knotweed or even the hawkweeds, they don't grow naturally here. So we've moved out just into field sites. Great. Okay, yeah, there's a couple more jumping in here. So uh, uh, this is from Tasha. If an, if an agency would like to undertake a program for a tertiary agent, are there permits required or consultation with the province? No, neither. So um, the, the permit, all the permits have been obtained. It's the Federal Plant Protection Act. Um, and once they have been permitted for the country, we don't need to um, obtain further permits for it. Um, but of note, um, a person should not actually be obtaining agents from outside of the province. That's a hint part of the question. And part of the reason is that the agents um, need to be verified genetically or morphologically by experts in order to bring them in to the province. So you would want to work with us um, in order to do any of that work. We have to supply them out to CFIA, get them verified with a voucher specimen on the identification, and then we can start to obtain some. So within the province itself, you would just go through all the documents that I mentioned, determine that it's tertiary and um, start working with it through all the data available. Okay. Um, okay, we've got a, a question here from Daniel. Uh, yeah, Scotch broom has, has um, become more of a, a Talking point and from some of my work at, at the middle at the moment, is there any biocontrol being considered for that? That's one of Daniel's biggest offenders at work. 
Uh, Scotch Broom has inventive agents on it. We do not have a permitted agent, but inventive. And they, the agents have been around for quite a long time. So they are kind of considered naturalized and the US has done a little bit of uh, study into them. And there hasn't been any documentation that they've moved off onto other types of plants. So where they exist is um, they are quite happy and they move quite well. Before this process um, came in that we were not to touch them, we happened to move them years ago up into the Kootenays. So they exist in the Kootenays as well as down on the coast. They're seed feeding agents. So if you're curious to where, if you have them, which likely you do, we've everywhere we've gone, we've found them. They feed on the seed in the pot just before they're about to um, pop open at the end of Jan uh, July, you could open the pods and find the two different species of seed feeders inside. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I was once at a, a talk in, at Iona Beach, and I think I heard that some uh, scotch broom species had come up from the U.S. there uh, quite a long time ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they the main they started mainly on the island is where we found them first, um, but we don't actually collect and move those around. However, if they were on your neighbor's property and um, as in you know right next door, and you did not have any because your plant was brand new, if you came over and you shipped them over onto yours, then then that's that would be acceptable, but not to move to different jumps in the province. Um, I think I, I just noticed one thing in the chat. We'll, we'll uh, an issue with one of the quiz questions. We'll attend to that uh, ASAP. But I'll just keep going through the questions here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, a question from Winona: Any considerations of biocontrol for sulfur sink foil? We have tried. We have funded that agent uh, or that plant. Um, for more than the time that I've been here, and we've resurrected the pro the um, the project many many times with new information and new understanding of the plant and and research uh, abilities, and we just we have not been able to find anything that is host specific enough to just attack that plant, and there was. Um, uh, one or two agents about 15 years ago that we came across or that the researchers came across and they have never been able to actually work with them to get them to survive, to do any studies on them. And if they can't work with them, then we would not be able to get them shipped and survive and put them out and work with them here. So um, truly, unfortunately, but the answer is no. Okay. Um... Yeah, obviously can't be options for everything out there. Um, quite a popular one here from Aaron. Um, Susan, you mentioned on your last slide for purple loosestrife that it's designated as lower concern and localized. Are you able to, to elaborate on that at all? Um, down on the island, like around the Nimo, there's a particular uh, population that crashed. Um, in further up the island, though, there's an area around Campbell River that seems to be influenced by tide. And we think that the agent doesn't survive very well on tidal water. Um, mm -hmm. Down on the lower mainland around uh, Chilliwack, there's lots of proof of loose strife along the dikes there. And that um, has been shown to decrease. And there's also another study by um, a localized, uh, the university down there, one of the, the colleges out in the lower mainland. They did a, a study and have shown that it's also decreasing. The um, Okanagan populations have ebbed and flowed. So the plant will pop up into new spots. And when it does, then you would be trying to obtain agents if it's not being fed on and then and put them in there. But it, it will ebb and flow. And it's interesting because some of the plant species like leafy spurge, um, will all of them will ebb and flow 
um, with climatic conditions. But years ago, we were brought over into the Kootenays and people were saying, this plant is just increasing. It's spreading all over the place. It's huge. And we walked around areas I'd been at um, many, many years before that. And I'm like, well, this looks fantastic compared to the last time I was here. So it's perspective too. What was big is now potentially smaller. Does it look like it's increasing? And it's just a long-term perspective. So um, if you find it and it's increasing and you don't find any agents on it, then certainly uh, talk to people and, and hopefully get a new population to introduce. Oh, you muted. Rookie mistake, apologies there. Um, another species sort of related one, uh, from Denise, or uh, what's happening with hawkweeds, orange and all the yellows? Oh, uh, that has been a long-term funded complex. And we have two agents in the province, Olocidia subterminalis. It's a tiny gall wasp. Um, it does not need to breed. It is, uh, but it hops from plant to plant to plant and it uh, attacks stolons and creates galls. And we um, did not have very much hope at the beginning. Uh, the scientists in Canada didn't have a lot of hope, but this last two years we have found um, significant galls at a couple of sites. And we did our first collection just a few weeks ago and moved that on and that attacks whiplash hawkweed. Um, it's, whiplash is a hybrid of orange and or sorry, mouse here, and I believe king. So there's a question of whether it can go on those other ones. Um, but so far, we have not found that. Uh, we've also had a brand new one for uh, called Chelosia urbana, and it's a fly, and that one goes on a few of the yellow ones. Oh, memory twist at the moment. I believe it's meadow and queen and king. Uh, we released it at two different sites, but so far we found nothing um, to survive. But sometimes um, we will put an agent out and we don't see it for a couple of years. And the scientists in the past used to say, if you don't see it for three years, it's done. But we've gone back and 10, 20 years later, we found it. So we're always, always hopeful. But that's a very slow one and a really difficult complex to control. Right, yeah, that's a, a big, quite a, quite a broad, a broad complex indeed, yeah. Uh, so we're, we're getting closer to 10, uh, but I would love to squeeze in a couple more questions. This next one from uh, Kalena, it seems pretty interesting. So the, the location of biocontrol release sites is typically protected in IAP. Will this information become available to land managers and, and other people in, in uh, the new invasives BC? I believe so, yes. Yeah, the blobs are coming off. And the blobs were supposed to come off more of the sites, but it was a glitch in the system and um, funding just went to other priorities to fix pieces. It's been an unfortunate, consistent spot, but I, I do believe it will be fixed. Okay, sounds great. I'm excited to get in there myself. Um, so to, just to keep us on 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm sorry that we can't get to the other questions, but uh, we'll do our best to facilitate uh, those answers. Um, so I'd like to thank you again so much, Susan, for, for sharing your expertise today. And, and thank you, thank, thanks to you as well, Gwen, and on behalf of the ISCBC and the IVMA and to everyone that is listening. So uh, well, we'll also be sending out a... Oh. I, I just, was there a question about the questions at the end that I needed to clarify? Um, I So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the questions and, and hopefully send those through to you to, to uh, answer. No, sorry, the, the quiz questions. I oh, yeah. Quiz question that needed to be clarified. Um, there, nothing you need to clarify. I think it's being Perfect. sorted on, on the back end there. Sorry, misunderstood you there. Um, but. Uh, we'll also be just uh, in the chat, we'll be sending out a, a link to a short survey to all participants. So we'd, we'd love you to fill that out if we can get your feedback and, uh, 
and ideas for future webinars. So, uh, and also finally, if, if you're not a member of the IVMA or ISCBC, please do visit the links in the chat to learn more. So um, yeah, Nadine will throw that last slide up again and the links and, uh, and yeah, I'd like to probably wrap up today. Thanks again, Susan and Glenn. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone.